going inside the issues of our community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. It's also, of course, hard to leave a job that I've loved. It's a meaningful job where you can make a difference in people's lives. But I've been doing this for 14 years now, really keeping my family in Cincinnati and commuting during the week to Washington. And so as much as I love Delta, <laughs> it will be great to be home. After three years as an aide in the White House of President George H.W. Bush, six terms in Congress, and stints as U.S. Trade Representative and Director of the Office of Management and Budget under President George W. Bush, Rob Portman has returned to Cincinnati, leaving almost everyone with the question of, what's next? Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. After two decades near the center of national power, Rob Portman still seems young, with the heart of, heart of his career still in front of him. In the midst of a summer that is pivotal for the nation and for the Republican Party, Rob is at home, a perfect time to find out what's on his mind. I'm joined this morning by Rob Portman, who at this moment is an attorney in private practice, a husband and a father, and a committed kayaker who I hope is getting ready for Paddle Fest. <laughs> uh, so Rob, welcome back to Newsmakers. It's you know, been I am a while. getting ready for Paddle Fest. It's great to be back on Newsmakers. Uh, this afternoon, I'm going down to the Ohio River. People don't think about that as a good place to paddle. But I'll be down there with my friend Lee Robinson, who you know, yes, yes. practicing for Paddle Fest. We've gone in that race uh, several years now, and we won it one year, so the pressure's on. we got to get out there gotta and get out there do and our get best. Get but the old, the old bones are getting kind of old, you know? No, nah, so I don't think so. That, why, why do you think I said you're young still? Yeah, I'm, I I'm, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> I, I want to make it clear that we are taping this. Uh, in early June because I'm going to be on vacation when this actually airs. So there's a little bit of time and who knows what might happen between the time we tape and the time that it's actually on. But thank you for being here. Uh, one of the things you've done is you've set up something called Ohio's Future, Ohio Futures PAC. Mm -hmm. What is that? And what, what, how does this work into your life right yeah. now? Well, first of all, it's great to be home. I, I was commuting for 15 years actually between the Congress job and then the two cabinet jobs and we always kept our home here but it mm -hmm. wasn't easy to really live at home. Now I'm living at home and it's terrific. I'm still traveling a lot but I, I love being home. I've got three teenagers so it's the right time to be home mm -hmm. um, and I've got a dad who's 85 so it's, it's neat yeah. to be able to spend some time with him and I'm working at a law firm 50% uh, of my time uh, back practicing law again. I was a partner in a firm here in Cincinnati before I left and I'm doing some community work, working on the coalition still for Drug Free Greater Cincinnati uh, mm -hmm. that I founded, gosh, 14 years ago, I think now. In fact, mm -hmm. I was with them this week doing some work with them and doing some other nonprofit work. And that's been fun. And then I've started this uh, political action committee that helps me get around the state. It's called Ohio's Future PAC. Its focus is on how to make Ohio more competitive. You know, Ohio used to be a real powerhouse in terms of our economy, jobs. We've fallen behind. We continue to fall behind. And this concerns me a lot. So whether I get back into public service or not, and I love public service, hope to do it again someday, um, I think we ought to be focusing on how to make Ohio uh, you know, the powerhouse it was before. And that means looking at tax policy, our regulatory policy, which is behind our energy policy, our education and retraining policy, you know, how to be sure that Ohio is at the cutting edge. But how does a PAC actually operate? I mean, you're raising money on the one hand, how are you then spending that money? What are you doing with a PAC? Help people understand that. Well, uh, spending too much right now, uh, just in terms of uh, giving contributions to other people. I'm helping candidates who I believe in who are pro-growth, job growth candidates around the state. Uh, there are a lot more candidates who are interested in getting help than we have funds for. Mm -hmm. And then we have a full-time executive director now, a guy named Andrew Sheffordini, mm -hmm. who ran my campaign here in Cincinnati for Congress probably 10 years ago now, mm -hmm. was at the White House with me, has come back to Cincinnati, uh, Sycamore High graduate. And Andrew's helping out uh, all around the state. Uh, so we've got one full-time person, and we've got contributions we're making to others. And then we're also doing some public policy research. Uh, we're trying to compile what's out there, but also do some of our own research on some of these issues like what should be our tax policy. How do you retain the jobs we have and then attract new businesses to Ohio to be sure we have good paying jobs here? So that's how we're, that's how we're using it. You know, there's been some difficult news in the last uh, six weeks or so. I mean, DHL's announcement, mm -hmm. uh, the announcement of Which could General affect Wilmington Motors. and ABX. And right, and then, you know, General Motors announcement mm -hmm. about shutdowns of certain plants. The Marine plant. Yeah. What, what is, you were in, you were in that trade job, mm -hmm. uh, U.S. Trade Representative, mm -hmm. what is it that a state like Ohio, a traditionally strong 
manufacturing state, different kind of economy now, different setting in terms of global positioning. What does a state have to do in order to uh, be competitive to bring good jobs for, for people who live here? Well, Ohio needs to do a lot of things, and it's difficult to summarize it, but I think you summarized it pretty well in saying that we are a heavy manufacturing state, so we have a higher percentage of workers and our economy is more dependent on manufacturing than other states. In manufacturing, there have been a lot of jobs lost, not because of trade, and frankly, 23% of manufacturing jobs in Ohio are entirely dependent on exports, and exports have been a strong uh, part of our economy. One of the few bright lights in our economy right now is mm -hmm. trade. Without trade, we would have had no economic growth uh, in our country and in Ohio over the last couple of quarters. Mm -hmm. So trade is doing well, but the fact is we're doing more with less because of productivity, efficiency, we're now producing more than ever, but with a lot fewer people. You know, General Motors is producing about the same number of cars they were 25 years ago, but with less than 25% of the workforce. So and what do we do about to, that? What, well, how do this we is, change that? This is why you need to attract new jobs, new businesses into Ohio that are part of the high technology economy that is growing around the country. We need to be part of that, and we're not as much as we should be. Um, Health care is a big opportunity in Cincinnati because we have the great bioscience, the research, Children's Hospital, University mm -hmm. Hospital, and so on. Uh, we have some great companies like Procter & Gamble and General Electric that are doing very well overseas. Uh, most of their revenue now comes from overseas. Mm -hmm. So we need to be sure that we are positioning ourselves to attract more businesses like that that are truly global businesses, taking advantage of the great workforce we have here and not turning our back to trade but instead saying let's engage with trade in a, in a smart way. Who are we losing those jobs? I mean, in that competitive world, I'm not talking about the global loss of jobs offshore, mm -hmm. but in terms of other states, mm -hmm. who do you see as doing well with attracting those sort of future jobs, good future jobs, and what are they doing that's different than Ohio's doing? It's a great question because you're right, a number of states are doing extremely well right now. They tend to be states uh, that are in higher growth areas in the south primarily. They are attracting foreign investment. Uh, they are attracting domestic investment. Uh, as I said earlier, it's, it's not simple, but there's a, there's a whole series of issues that need to be addressed in order to be sure you are retaining and attracting jobs. When I was in Congress, I worked on trying to attract, for instance, a major employer to our area who was looking at our tax policy in Ohio. And although we've had some improvements in tax policy since then, we still are a relatively high tax state for a company coming in. Uh, look at the growth going on in Northern Kentucky. A lot of that's being driven by people who want to move to Northern Kentucky to make that uh, their tax residence because we have relatively high taxes here. So tax policy is one. Uh, I mentioned regulatory policy. We need to be smarter in terms of our regulations. Uh, not that we shouldn't have regulations for health and safety, but we need to be sure that we are doing it in a way that is consistent with economic growth. Energy policy, health care policy, education and worker retraining. We've got more of an onus on us than most states because think of all the workers, not just auto company workers, but the steel workers, say, in Northeast Ohio, who have lost their jobs right. and are looking for something, and the current way we retrain people is not working well to land them in the kind of jobs that they, they want to have with good benefits and good pay. So those are the kinds of things you need to do, and you need to create an environment in Ohio that's conducive to job growth, you know, a pro-growth, pro-jobs environment. And trade is a big part of it, too. We need to be more aggressive on trade. We've been talking about what Ohio needs. Yeah. This raises a question that's out there. Is your logical next step to run for governor mm -hmm. and you know, try to put these kinds of policies in play in Ohio? Is that, is that something that's on your mind and are you interested in that? Well, first, I have a passion for trying to help get Ohio back on its feet. And, you know, I think about when I grew up, when you grew up in Ohio, in Cincinnati, you know, we were an economic powerhouse. We can be that again. We've mm -hmm. got the workforce. We've got the educational facilities. I was at Cincinnati State this week, by, mm -hmm. by the way. We've got terrific opportunities uh, here, right here locally, to be able to retrain people and be competitive. So I have that passion. Okay. I also love public service. Okay. On the other hand, I just got home, you know, and, uh -huh. uh, and, and, and I came home to spend more time with my family, and that's what I'm doing right now. There is a governor's race coming up in 2010. Yes. Uh, that's a few years from now. So I have the opportunity, uh, two years from now, I have the opportunity to be able to take a look at that, and I will. This year I'm going to focus on being home, uh, Ohio's future, as I said, uh, the campaign of John McCain for president. Ohio will be, once again, in the middle of it all, will be one of these swing states. And we'll, come, we'll come to McCain in a minute. Uh, and helping to build the Republican Party, which has fallen on hard times in Ohio, as, as you know. 
after this election, then I'll make a decision as to a potential governor's race or a Senate race in the future. Um, or just being, you know, a good dad and a better husband and uh, <laughs> a better son and, uh, and being here. I, you know, I mean, I, the reality I, is... I, if I haven't decided yet, but if, I'm, I'm interested. If you're going to run, you're interested. Yeah, I'm interested in the possibility. And if, and if you're going to run in 2010 mm -hmm. for governor, you've got to make that decision probably at the end of this year, mm -hmm. right? The end of this calendar year? You know, people Otherwise, tend, you can't put the, the pieces together. People tend to start campaigns earlier and earlier. I don't think that's a good idea for the nation, frankly, because it seems like we're always campaigning. Right. But yeah, probably you have to make a decision by the end of this year. And, and some people have been pushing me to make a decision already. I'm just, uh, I don't think that's the right thing to do. I think it's better to focus on this year and being sure that okay. uh, John McCain is successful, that the Republican Party gets back on its feet and focus on whether I really think I, I can add value. I, I believe I can, but I'm doing the research to be sure that we have solid policy positions that really make sense for our state. Let's talk about uh, President Bush. You've been, you've served both of the, in both of the Bush White Houses. Yes. Uh, in different capacities. Mm -hmm. um, most recently, the current President Bush. Mm -hmm. President Bush's popularity rating is not high. Mm -hmm. Given where it stands right now towards the end of his second term, how would you evaluate the presidency mm -hmm. of George Bush? Well, first you mentioned I worked for both George Bushes and, um, you know, when I was, oh gosh, uh, at the White House in 1991 and left then in March of 91 to come home to Cincinnati, I remember the president was at 85% uh, approval rating. This is first President Bush, as his son was after 9-11. In November of that same year, he got 38% of the vote against Bill Clinton, 1992. Right. Right. So I've seen how you can go up and go down. But uh, this president's been down for a while. But here's the, here's the interesting thing. That same President George H.W. Bush is now at sky-high approval ratings mm -hmm. as a former president. Former president. So people are looking back at his record what about, and what saying... What about this president? Well, I think the same thing, same thing can happen here. I think, honestly, it will depend on what happens in Iraq, uh, among other things, uh, what happens with our economy. But if you look back at former presidents and you see how they are judged in retrospect, it's often very different. Harry Truman's the best example. The last president with the kind of low approval ratings right. the current president have was, was Harry Truman. Today, Democrats and Republicans alike hold him up as a president who had the courage of his convictions and made strong decisions, even though it wasn't always politically popular. His his standing in history, as an historian, you understand right. this is very different. And I, th I think there's a good chance the same will happen with the current I, I think there's Bush. actually an interesting local example, um, William Hart Taft, mm -hmm. who wasn't a very popular president mm -hmm. uh, and actually didn't like being president, no. was a great ex-president because he became justice of the Supreme yeah. Court. I think yeah. Jimmy Carter is, yeah. had an incredible ex-presidency. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's this book that came out, uh, Scott McClellan. I'm sure you know Scott McClellan. You, you've you've 30 read this? 30% off already? My gosh. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, yeah, yeah, okay. What's your reaction to this? First of all, I know Scott. Uh, I've known him for years. Uh, the, the book shocked me. For those of you who haven't read this book, and I haven't read it yet, but I've, you know, seen the excerpts seen, of We've it. seen a lot of it. Seen a lot of it. Uh, he, is, uh, he is critical uh, in certain regards. Uh, I understand it's actually more balanced than it's been reported because there are good and bad parts in there, but he's, he's critical of the run-up to the war in Iraq. I guess I have two thoughts about it. One is uh, he should have raised those concerns when he was press secretary, and he acknowledges now in his interviews and so on that he didn't uh, and he wishes he had also. But I think your job when you're in an administration, as you know, I had two cabinet jobs there, is to raise those concerns, and I certainly did it. Uh, I didn't always get my way, but on the other hand, I thought I was But there was an atmosphere policy. that you could raise absolutely. those concerns? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I had some heated discussions uh, with my boss, the president, but also with other cabinet members. And, you know, that's, that, that's your job is to raise the concerns. You win some, you lose some, but then you go together as a team. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one thought I have is that I'm disappointed in Scott that he didn't raise those concerns when he had the opportunity to. Um, second thing I, I will say is... Some of the things that he talks about in that book, I'm told, about Iraq, he wouldn't necessarily have been part of because he was the Deputy Press Secretary for Domestic Affairs when that was happening. So I'm a little, I've talked to some people who were involved who said, God, Scott wasn't in the room when these decisions were made. How does he know what happened? And he does acknowledge now, I think, that some of it was secondhand information. So, you know, I, I'm disappointed. Uh, I feel sorry for Scott, frankly, because I, I think this is, um, 
uh, this has been tough for him. If you've seen him on some of the shows, right. uh, it's, it's been a difficult situation for him. And again, a lot of this is, you know, different people's perspectives sort of with a snapshot at this time. We'll see what it looks like in a couple of years. Okay. Um, you know, if Iraq gets uh, to where the president and all of us hope it will, which is a Democrat republic that is stable and that is an ally in the war against terror, I think things will look very different. Okay, stay right there. Thank you. Stay tuned. Rob's staying with us after the break. We'll talk about, oh, gee, I don't know, John McCain? <laughs> Welcome back. I'm here this morning with Rob Portman, who is back in Cincinnati after uh, 20 years, 14 years, whatever it is, 15 years in, in Washington. Um, Rob, obviously this summer, uh, we're in the midst of a major, impo majorly important president, I guess every presidential campaign is a turning point, mm -hmm. but certainly a, a turning point here. The nominee of your party is John McCain. Mm -hmm. Um, you have supported John McCain. You've been very public about that. What, what is it that John McCain has to do in order to win this election? Mm -hmm. First of all, the, the polls are pretty good right now, and that's just a snapshot, so we'll see what happens in November. The only poll that matters is Election Day. Right. But if you look at the national polls, and there was one that came out this week, it was Gallup's compilation of all the polls in the last month. They're just dead even. I mean, it's basically head-to-head. -head. Uh, John McCain is ahead in a poll I saw today, but they're basically dead even, 45-45. Which, which, very honestly, is amazing given the fact of the it's a tough all year. sorts of things. Tough it's year tough year for, year for Republicans. Republicans. Tough year for Republicans. In Ohio, John McCain is actually up in most of the polls. Again, the poll I saw today is up four points. I saw one last week. He's up five, probably close to the margin of error. Mm -hmm. But the point is... Uh, it's going to be, I think, another very close election. And here in Ohio, in fact, the Republican John McCain is doing better than people would expect and better than George Bush was four and eight years ago, where he sort of came from behind. So I think John McCain can win, uh, and I think he can win, uh, you know, because of the strength of his character. He's an independent guy. People like him uh, because of his independence. Also because I think on the issues, which is going to be the economy and jobs, number one in Ohio, and a lot of other important swing states, that's a top mm -hmm. issue. And because of foreign policy, I think he's closer to where most people are. What does he have to do in terms of his relationship to your former boss, President Bush? How does he have to play this? Well, you know, it's interesting to watch that. Uh, just this week, he gave a speech where he talked about some of his distinctions from President Bush. Uh, he doesn't have to do too much because there is an understanding, certainly in the media and among a lot of people in the public, as to who John McCain is. He ran against George Bush in 2000. He's been in the public spotlight, uh, certainly for the last 20 years, uh, as a national figure in ways that Barack Obama has not been. And he's pretty well identified. And he's identified as a guy who, you know, speaks his mind, straight talk, but also takes policy positions that he believes are in the interest of the country that are sometimes at odds with his own political party. That's who he is. So it's not too tough for him to just say, look, here's the position I took on, you know, any number of issues he, he can raise, and, you know, that, that's what I'm going to do going forward. He has some credibility on that. The, the question that's out there, your name keeps popping up. It's popped up in some Wall Street Journal and the New York Times as a possible running mate. Mm -hmm. Have you ever talked mm -hmm. to Senator McCain one-on-one -on -one about this possibility? No, no. And I don't expect to either. Uh, I, he's got a lot of good candidates on the list uh, for VP. Most of them are former governors or current governors. And I think that's probably well, where he will end up. Uh, as we talked about earlier, I've been commuting for almost 15 years now from Washington. I'm not eager to go back to Washington right now. I love being home. Uh, so that's fine. I think I can help him by being home. You know, honestly, Ohio will be, again, one of the key states, and I'm committed to helping him win re-election here in Ohio. I mean, the logic, logic of having a governor and a, a chief executive on that ticket someplace, mm -hmm. which is why it plays back to what we were talking about in the first part of the show, why it may make sense for you to be governor of Ohio someday if there's even another step down the road. Is that fair? Uh, it may be fair. It's not how I look at it, honestly. I mean, I think you, you take every job one at a time and do your best at it. Um, I, I don't aspire to, you know, some scheme as some politicians might 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 do as to as to some future office that's a higher office 
if I do end up running for governor, it'll be because I think I can be a good governor of Ohio and help Ohio get back on its feet. And we'll see what happens after that. Let me turn the tables on you. What about Barack Obama? What does he have to do to win? Well, he has an interesting challenge, particularly in states like Ohio, where Mrs. Clinton uh, beat him handily here in Ohio, as he did in Kentucky, by the way, and West Virginia, so states around here. And the reason is there are Democrats who are, uh, you know, Clinton supporters and supported Bill Clinton in 92 and 96 when he won Ohio, who are still uncomfortable with Senator Obama. Now, that may change, uh, but if you look at the polling right now, if people are asked after they finish voting in these primaries, you supported uh, Senator Clinton, now can you support Barack Obama? About half of them say that they are uncomfortable doing that. So that's his biggest challenge, I think, is to get Democrats uh, to come home. And uh, he may have a hard time because he's positioned himself on the issues pretty far to the left of the Democratic Party. And, you know, the biggest tax increase in American history or big new spending programs, the way he's approached the foreign policy side with the immediate withdrawal from Iraq, creating a vacuum there, uh, and potential new terrorist safe haven there. He's put himself to the left of Hillary Clinton. As you know, she ran a mm -hmm. campaign over the last couple months to his right. So uh, he's, he's going to have an interesting so, general so, election challenge. So if he's looking to balance his ticket, mm -hmm. and he offered you the vice presidency, <laughs> would you accept that? As much as I don't believe that that will ever happen with Senator McCain, <laughs> I can be even more forthright with regard to uh, Senator Obama. And look, Senator Obama is an eloquent person. I, I know him. Um, you do uh, know him personally? I do know him, and um, you know he obviously gives a great speech, and uh, I think people who underestimate him do it at their own peril, uh, and he will be a formidable opponent. There's no question about that. But the question is, at the end of the day, is he the right person to be president of the United States given the challenges that we currently face? And you said earlier this is an important election. I think it's a watershed election. I think it is in terms of our economy, our position in the world, not just in terms of foreign policy, but our position in the world economically. We need to figure out where the United States fits so that we can continue to be the global but, leader. And I think his positions would set us back, would make us less competitive, would make us less able to compete and win uh, going into the 21st century. So I think it's a, it's a critical but time. But if you read the foreign press, in fact, there's a great deal. I mean, we have a, we have a lot of problems out there mm -hmm. uh, because of the current administration. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of hope that there's real new direction mm -hmm. with Barack Obama. There's a lot of excitement in Europe, uh, for sure, uh, about that. If you if you just take a look at their newspapers and things, so well, no question. If if the Europeans were voting in November instead of Americans, Barack Obama would be our next president. Um, I don't know what that says. They uh, don't have a he vote. would he would win France, but he's not likely to win Ohio. I, I, I don't think. But I want to get to one. But, there, more. but let me just say something on that quickly. Uh, Senator McCain will also offer fresh direction. And you've seen him overseas. You've seen what he has said about the use of American power. Uh, he mm -hmm. believes it ought to be limited. He believes that America ought to be humble. Uh, he has some specific positions on issues, uh, including climate change that are you know, widely applauded in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, to the extent you care about Europe, um, the fact is there's going to be a new direction. There's going to be a new Congress as well. And um, I think. When you, when, you, when you look at this election, it'll be very close, but I think Senator McCain is closer to where most people in Ohio are and where most Americans I are. I want to ask, and I only, I've only got less than two minutes left, so, but uh, a question that I think is getting ignored in the campaign right now, and that's this looming issue of Social Security mm -hmm. that's out there. Mm -hmm. It's not being talked mm -hmm. about. We haven't done anything about it in the last administration. Mm -hmm. What do you think has to be done about that issue? Well, you're absolutely right. And, and as you know, I have strong feelings on right. this one. And uh, you know, if I get back into public service, this will be one of my passions, is to figure out how to fund what is now an unsustainable growth in not just Social Security, but Medicare and Medicaid. Mm -hmm. We simply do not have the ability with our current revenues to be able to afford the promises that we've made. We've got to face up to it. It's a moral issue, really, because your kids, we talked about kids and grandkids right. a little while ago, are going to be the ones left holding the bag. And so I, I hope that as you get into the campaign, not only Social Security and the entitlements issue generally, right. but policy in general will become something people talk about more. This election has been fascinating, maybe the most interesting in my adult lifetime, but it hasn't been focused enough on policy. This isn't fair because you only have about 30 seconds left, but as a Republican, are you willing to talk about raising taxes to meet those obligations, the moral obligations? Well, raising taxes will not solve the problem of Social Security. But it unless could you, be a piece. 
Well, it could be, but the, the point is the whole system needs to be reformed. It's a pay-as-you-go system that doesn't work with the demographics, and unless we face up to that and are willing to reform the whole system on a bipartisan basis, as yeah. you know, I like to do things across the aisle. That's this right. is a classic one where you've got to join hands as Americans, not as Republicans or Democrats. Uh, we're going to be in real trouble unless we do that. And that, I think, will become more of an issue because Senator McCain does talk about it. Uh, Senator McCain is you know, adamant about spending. He's adamant about dealing with these right. entitlement issues. So I think it'll start to raise. And that has to be issue. done early in whoever the next administration. It has to happen early yes. in, the, in the administration. Yeah, that's when it's most likely to be successful. Rob, early thank in the administration. you. How, why do I feel that you're going to be back here? Any Great to be with you, Dan. Times? Okay. Good to be back on Newsmakers. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week to meet the men and the women working to shape our community for the future. Have a good week. Oh, no. It's rough.